Good morning, church. It's good to be home. I was, um, for the last couple of weeks, we were in Corpus Christi, Texas, at a sibling reunion, sitting there in a large house right in front of the Gulf of Mexico on Padre Island. You know, it was tough work, but someone has to do it. <laughs> we really did have a great time. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, take a couple of weeks off, and also thank you for the blessing to come back. The fact is, uh, we are family. And of all days of the year, on this Mother's Day, Feliz Dia de las Madres, uh, I wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. I can tell you that uh, it's a special day for me, not only because of the memories of my mother, but my own bride and our three boys, but our daughters-in-law and so forth. It's just a special moment to come together. So I just want to say welcome to everyone, including um, mis hermanos y hermanas. Es bueno que estemos aquí en el día del Señor porque somos la familia de Dios, no cualquier familia, sino la familia de Cristo. Es importante y, la, y es la verdad. I do believe it is the truth. We are the family of God. In fact, that's the reason we all congregate. We congregate because we are saved, we are in the body of Christ, and if you're visiting this morning, we would love to have you work with us on our journey of faith. This is a special family. It's a beautiful family. I know I'm a, I'm a bit biased, but, uh, you know, truth is truth, right? Verdad is verdad. Um, I can tell you that hanging up in our, one of our rooms in our house is, um, is a piece of cross stitch. Actually, I thought it was cross stitch, and Debbie told me yesterday, that's not cross stitch. It was some, sign of, it was some sort of calligraphy or something. But anyway, it's, uh, it, reads, it reads, the mother of three children has a special place reserved in heaven. Now, I can tell you that it's been there for 37 years. That happens to be the age of our youngest son, Shane. And about 37 years ago, uh, Laureen, our sister-in-law, gave that to Deb. And it's been, it's been on the wall ever since. And every time I see it, I think, you know, I believe it. I do believe there's a special place in heaven, uh, at least for Deb. I'm not sure about you, but I know there is for Debbie. <laughs> for all of us, actually. You know, today we celebrate Mother's Day, church, and I know for most of us it's a celebration. I'm also well aware, very cognizant, that for others it's challenging, it isn't easy for whatever reason. I've been in ministry long enough to know that there are sisters of mine um, who have actually chosen not to attend on this day, and my heart just breaks for them, goes out to them, for whatever reason, maybe, you know, some because they had a challenging relationship with their mother, but mostly because they've tried themselves to have children, and for whatever reason, only God knows, um, they haven't. And I just want you to know, I'm, I'm sorry, um, and I thank you for being here from the bottom of my heart, for the last 40 plus years as I've preached and this day's rolled around, I've tried to say thank you for all of those of you who, who come, even though there may be some who would rather not be here. We understand that. Your presence, by the way, speaks volumes of your love for God and your love for each other. Isn't that wonderful? You know, for, for example, we are truly family. We're not all mothers, but we're all family. And we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we weep with those who weep. As you uh, leave this sanctuary uh, later on, this auditorium, and you walk outside, and the mothers will be given a rose by one of our shepherds, I want you to know that there were two ladies who put all that together. And I just happened to find that out just a moment ago. Sharon and Linda. 
Linda Eller and Sharon Hicks, who both have, don't have children. When asked, well, you know, you don't really have to do this, they said, we don't want the mothers to have to work. I mean, it's that kind of familia, de Dios. It's that, it's that moment between all of us. And those outside, those in the world, just can't comprehend it. They just don't understand. And the reason they don't understand is because they're not in kingdom work. They're lost. In fact, God has called us to reflect his love to everyone in the hope that God, through, through grace and faith of their own for those who are lost, might come into the family of God. It's why we were created in the very beginning. And so I use familia a lot. I was talking to Jose earlier. I've only got these, you know, I'm trying to do my best for Spanish. You know, estoy intentando. It's muy difficult, you know. <laughs> I am trying, though. Why? Because I want everyone in the family of God to know we are together in this. Regardless the language we speak, regardless of the weather, the fact that we're mothers or fathers or, 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 you know, or, or anyone else, we are in this together. In any case, uh, you know, I do believe it's a calling from God. You know, I mean, we, we, are all, we all have different callings from God. One of the reasons I believe that motherhood is a calling from God is because otherwise he would have not have given them eyes in the back of their head. There has to be some special calling. I can tell you, and I wasn't going to go through this because this might be a bit of a lengthy service, but that's okay. Somos la familia de Dios. We can do it. We're family. But when I was about seven years old in Corpus Christi, my mother uh, scolded me in our little house, the only house that I remember growing up, uh, had a little bitty, you know, kind of a small little ranch style house, I don't know, about, about a thousand square feet or so, had a little hallway, and I recall mama scolding me for something that I'm sure I didn't do, but nonetheless, and as she turned around, I stuck my tongue out, literally. She didn't even turn back around. She stopped in mid-stride. And she said, get that tongue back in your mouth, Michael. And then I just kind of, she never turned around. And finally I said, oh, Mama, how? She says, all mothers have eyes in the back of their heads. Now that's pretty scary for a six-year-old. Every time I hugged her for the next year or so, I only did it because I wanted to feel <laughs> the back. I told her that one day, and she says, they retract. They go back in. And they only come out when needed. It, it was, so it's got to be a calling from God. But I am so grateful, church, that we're all together this morning. So it's a wonderful time to congregate. I delivered... Uh, my first Mother's Day sermon at Antioch in May of 2006. I know it's hard to believe that was 13 years ago. I have no doubt they remember the sermon I preached, right? How many were here in 2006? Okay, what did I preach on? <laughs> mothers! Oh, I preached on mothers. Mm. And if you have a hard time remembering what I preached on it, follow the series of, on Obadiah. Remember that? <laughs> okay. I can tell you that when I finished that sermon, on my way out, I was talking with Dwayne Clark, whose mother passed away in 05. Yeah. And Dwayne said something like, you should have met mom. And I thought, I have no doubt, brother. I had only known, you know, Dwayne for a few months, but I thought, what a mother he must have had. And then later on, I had the privilege to meet Dorothy. That's William Beard's mama. And um, I enjoyed seeing Dorothy there. And I know that William and the family buried her just a couple of years ago. In any case, uh, I'm going to have an actual sermon here in a moment. It, uh, uh, just a couple of points. Um, but I was thinking, you know, what's the best way to do this? Because this is family. And so I thought, well, I'll just invite Dwayne to share a few words, kind of a tribute to his mother. And I'll ask William to share a few words, tribute to Dorothy. So without any further delay, and then following my brother Dwayne and William, I'll share a few thoughts of my own.
Thank you, Whit. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to get up this morning and tell you about my mom. I just hope I can get through this thing. I bought a paper towel along with me to wipe my eyes out because uh, I cried weddings. You know, the most one of the most happy times any any, any time around is a wedding. But this morning. My name is Dwayne Clark. I would like to tell you about my mother. Mom and dad were married in 1932. Mom, Helen, was 21, and dad, Leslie, was 23. And two years later, I became their first child. Mom and dad started their family working on a farm that they brought. Growing up on a farm meant that everyone shared the chores and our family was no different. 19 years and three farms later, our family had grown to be mom, dad, five children, three boys and two girls. What was mom's schedule when only her children were in the home? Get up at 4 a.m. and cook breakfast for the family. Biscuits, gravy, eggs, meat and jelly or jam, that she had made from fruit and berries grown on the farm. At 5.30 when breakfast was ready, us children were awakened for breakfast. We ate and then we, including mom, went to the barn, milked the 15 or so cows. The spare milk after saving a gallon or so for drinking and cooking was placed in 10 gallon cans and were picked up by the milk carrier and delivered to market. The proceeds from the milk was used to buy groceries and other items needed for the family. I want to give you some statistics relating to mom. Mom had five children, 11 grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren, and mom that mom touched, held, and loved on. For all of these 38 persons, she made at least one quilt or blanket. All of these items were made by mom. Much of the material that went into these early items was made using the scrap cloth material left over from material that she had bought for making our clothes. All the blankets were quilted or pieced together and quilted by mom. Her most productive year, she made 26 quilts in her spare time. None of us know the total number of quilts that mom made during her lifetime. Mom was born August the 25th, 1915, and died April the 4th at the age, 2005, at the age of 89. I would like to read to you what my brothers and sisters had to say about the mother that we all shared. Number two child was my sister Peggy. I always think of mother as a woman of few words. Her silence spoke volumes. Many times as we get older, we think we know it all and speak when we should be silent. I think of mother when I'm in that situation and try hard to keep silent. She would just smile and let it fall off her shoulders. She was not a person to worry or it if she did, she did not let, it, let us know. She would answer the phone with this word, all right. And in her world, that's the way everything was, all right. Number three child, Larry. I remember mom as being the most loving person I ever knew. I made the comment once that she was the smartest person I knew. I said that to get anything she wanted, all she needed to do was make daddy think he was King Kong. She informed me that he was. You can't beat that kind of love. Number four child, Tommy. Some characteristics of mom would include her calmness, her work ethics, her loving and caring for others, especially for family and friends, more than herself. 
and her ability to get more done than believed possible. Her talents and gifts were many and varied. She made us better persons. Thank God for our dear mom. Amen. Number five child, Barbara, the baby. Barbara came along the last and she was born when I was a senior in high school. So we had a long time with children in the family. First, Barbara says, first I hope I'm like mom when I grow up. Her traits were always calm. She, moved, she loved us unconditionally. She was also always ready to help us and believed that all of us were special in our own way. She loved daddy and let him think he was in control when really she was the one that kept everything together. She was always content no matter the situation. She knew her limits, which was a great help to all of us. She loved God and set that example to her family every day. Being the oldest child, I wish I could tell you that I trained her to be the world's best mom because she really was. My wife told me to be sure and stay on text this morning. But before I close, I want to mention two other moms that have been a blessing to me. First, my wife, Nancy, the mother of Lisa Shacklett, our daughter, and the mother of our grandchildren, Clark and Shelby. Thank you, and a blessed Mother's Day to all of you. Thank you very much. Morning, family. Morning. Happy Mother's Day to our mothers. Though I am partial to one, she was slightly over five feet in height, but she was 10 feet tall in stature. As I watched the video, did y'all love that video early on? I love the part about the referee and the whistle. And for, for those who don't know me, my name is William, and I am from a family of 11. And yes, I am the baby. <laughs> I hear that all the time. My mom did not own a whistle. She didn't need it, really. Whenever things happen, a fight or whatever, she will allow the fight to go on. After the fight was over, the loser normally got two whoopings. He got beat up in the fight, and he got a beating from mom. So don't let five foot women fool you. They have a, a pack of wallop in their hands. But what I want to talk to you today about, I don't want to kind of take any uh, thunder from wit, and I don't want to overshadow any mothers here today. Mothers are very important. They rear our children. They honor the home, they take care of the home. When fathers are not there, when fathers are off to work, it, it's all mother. When children accomplish things, who they always call on or respond to? Mother, it's always mother. Like I told my wife, I said, man, why they didn't mention their dad? And I'm, it's always mothers. Mothers have a special gift for raising children. And like Witt said, eyes in the back of their head. But my mom had eyes everywhere. You could not get away with anything. She saw it. And if you spoke back, it's a trip to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read two passages of scripture. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three but the greatest of these is love. Then I want to go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. That's why we love our mothers, because they exemplify the fruit of the Spirit. Even when it's time to be the disciplinarian, they do it in love. Now, here's a question. When you're disciplined by your father, after a few minutes or hours pass by, do you go back to your father? No. When you're disciplined by mother, after a few minutes or hour pass by, you run right back to your mother. Why? Because you see the love in her. Even though you just got a beating, you still see that love. And she does it with love. I'm telling you right, my mom whooped with love. <laughs> I love you, I love you. But she whooped with love. And when you got 11 kids, you've got to be father and mother. She was both father and mother. And she can command an audience. Whenever she said anything, we all stood at attention. We did, because we did not want the end result, which was, say it with me, a beating. <laughs> right, right. Paul's letter to the Philippian church was that their love grow according to knowledge. And what he wants them to do, based on the knowledge that they learned, their love grew. And parents, the knowledge that mothers have of children, the ins and out. My, mom, my wife knows things about my daughter that I don't know. I'm like, really? And I'm there every day. But mothers have the mental capacity and knowledge about children that men just don't have. And if you got 11 kids, you're dealing with 11 different character traits. I mean, the attitudes are totally different. I mean, I, I would say night and day, but there's only two days, so I don't know how you put that for 11 kids. Would it be morning, noon, evening, however you get to 11? But you had all those different attitudes you had to deal with. How do you do that? Where mothers have the knowledge, knowledge and the capability of figuring out how to speak with children, what they need at that particular time, and how to get them to it. My mom had that ability. Though she was slightly over five foot, she had that ability to know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it, and also when it is time to stop talking and show action. This is what Paul had for the Philippian church. He wanted them to grow, uh, he wanted their love to grow according to knowledge. The love that comes from a mother is based on the knowledge of her family and the information that she has gathered day by day about each and every child. Our maturity is measured by our love, and our love is measured by our knowledge of God's will. This is what mothers possess, the knowledge of God's will, the love factor, the agape love, unconditional, even when we screw up, even when we're not desirable, they still display love. And my mom, and I, I brought this right here. I don't know if y'all can see that. If you like me, you, you got these now. So if y'all have these and you can't see, put them on. But this is my mom. And she raised 11 kids practically by herself. And she did it with love and discipline, of course. Because I, I was a troubled child growing up. I'm, growing up. I'm just telling you right now. For those who don't know me, I was a troubled child growing up. I stayed in trouble a lot. So if you want to know about it, come ask me. I'll tell you about it. But anyway, my mom raised 11 kids by herself. And everybody turned out pretty good. There's always one bad apple. I'm not the bad apple. <laughs> there's one badder than me. But there's always one bad apple. But she done a spectacular job. And uh, she's, she went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. And I think about her all the time. So this Mother's Day, I want to honor her with my life continually. And everybody in the audience, I want you to honor your mother with your life continually. The Bible says, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you. That's what we do. That's what we're doing today. Not only today, but every day. Thank you.
two of my heroes in the faith, both, um, both Dwayne and William. You know, I learned a lot from my father as well. From my father, I learned the value of hard work. Dad was a hard worker, worked all the time to provide for his family. I learned from my father the, the value of, of getting along with one's neighbor and others in the business world. He really understood the Proverbs where it talks about a soft answer turns away wrath. I learned really how to love my neighbor from my dad. But my faith comes from mother, from mama. And as you look at scripture, it's clear that we are to love God and love our neighbor, love others. And in my family, and I know and with Debbie and me the same way, dad taught me how to love my neighbor, but I owe my faith to mama. And that's just the way it is. She was the one who scurried about the house all the time, taking care of four children. She's the one who scurried about on Sunday morning, getting all of us up and, and dressed and, and bathed and so forth. Dad had his part. You know, every couple has to work it out. My father would get the newspaper on Sunday morning and a cup of coffee while Mama was just scurrying about, you know, getting everyone ready for church. Dad was a faithful Christian, but I owe my faith to Mama. I can tell you, every time I ask her for a question in Scripture, she basically had two books, and I've said this before, I know in a class setting, Mother was an English teacher as well, um, and she had two books that she would always be putting in my lap, and I suspect the other, the other kids as well, but certainly in mine. Every time I'd ask a question about Scripture, she could have given me the answer. But no, she gives me the Bible, and she says, you look it up. And then she would help me. It's in this book, this chapter, and probably around these verses. You read the entire chapter. You look it up. The other book she carried was a dictionary. And every word I asked, you know, how do you spell this word or what does it mean, should give me a dictionary. Those two things. But mostly scripture. I can recall mother telling me one time, now Michael, remember... And she would, at the, at the dinner table, she, she and dad would talk about the preacher's sermons. I have no doubt that you don't do that kind of thing. But they would sit around and they would share, sometimes good, but usually it was in a, you know, it was in a, it was in a constructive, critically way. And she would say across the table, when I would ask a question about it, I don't think the other three kids even cared, but I was curious. And she would say, Michael, the preacher may be wrong. And then she would always add, and the elders may be wrong. And your daddy and I may be wrong. But the word of God will never mislead you. It was just drilled in me from an early, early age. Similarly with Deb and our three boys, she's the one who scurried about the house. I was gone frequently. 30 years in the military, you can't stay home all the time. Even when I was there on a Sunday morning, what was I preparing for? I wasn't a tank commander. I wasn't a pilot. I was a chaplain. So I was concerned about my troops and, and, and what sermon to prepare and, and how to bring them to Christ. And it was Debbie who would ensure that our three sons were always up and ready with or without me. She's the one who would scurry about. She was the one who would sing. And I, <clears throat> you know, have you ever, you know, a, a little birdie, a little birdie with the yellow bill hopped up on my windowsill, cocked his shiny head and said, get up, get up, you sleepy head. <laughs> get up, get up, get out of bed. It's time for Bible school. I never sang that one time, but I heard it. Thousands. I have always considered her to be the evangelist and me to be the discipler. Mothers do not believe the lies of the world. They're not in the kingdom business. Look at the Ten Commandments very quickly. 
we have in Exodus 20, we have God calling Moses on Mount Sinai, and, and Moses, you know, God etching in a stone tablet, you shall have no other gods before me. You will not make for yourself any graven image. You will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. Ten. And on those ten, the entire law of, of Moses was built, and Jesus said, I came not to abrogate, to destroy, Matthew 5, 17, I came to fulfill the law. Those ten commandments are the, are the foundation, not only of the world's creation, but of our faith in God. And they are divided clearly into two large segments. The first four, you shall make, you shall have no other gods before me, no graven image, do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, and remember, the, and, and, and remember the Sabbath day. Those all focus on God. And then the other six focus on loving each other. Now, I don't know if these ten are prioritized, but I think they are. And if you read through them, you'll see the priority. The very first thing that God wanted his people to understand, the most important commandment, you will have no other gods before me. Loving God. But notice the very first one in loving others. It wasn't you shall not murder or you shall not commit adultery, or you shall not steal, or you will not lie, or you will not covet, the very first commandment, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Why? Why is the highest priority loving God and having no other gods before him, and the highest priority in loving others is to honor your father and your mother. Because they're both, especially the mother, they're in kingdom work. It's what they do, it's why, they were, it's why God created us, kingdom work. It doesn't mean that we can't work in the kingdom if we're not a mother or father. It means that the responsibility of the parent is kingdom growing. Nothing else comes even close. Matthew 18 and 19, two great chapters where Jesus is speaking, and in both moments, both full chapters, he's given the discourse of the kingdom, and repeatedly he talks about the children. He'll say, for example, in Matthew 19, 13 and 14, when, by the way, it was rabbinic law, rabbinic duty for parents to want to bring their children before rabbis, to have them bless them and touch them. And Jesus was the master teacher. And so as the crowds were listening to Christ, the parents, I would have done the same thing, and I know Deb would have, the parents wanted to take their little children to Jesus and have him lay his hands on them and bless them. But the disciples were preventing it. <laughs> Can you believe it? And Jesus scolded the disciples. He said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Mothers do not believe the lies of the world. The prince of this world is not God. We live in a fallen world, and the world outside families of God, they, they don't understand. They're led by a different standard. Don't let anyone tell you that there is greater respect and responsibility outside the home. It's a lie. It doesn't mean that one can't work outside the home. It just means that your greatest responsibility, by the way, for the dad too, your greatest responsibility is in the home. 
It's to nurture and admonish the children. Why? That they might understand God and the love of God. That's, who, that's what we do. Nothing else even comes close. I can recall telling my wife and telling my boys too as they got older, listen, the hardest, <laughs> the hardest job in the world, and I don't like the word job, but the, but the hardest energy expending uh, a part of me, you, in the world is being a good parent. Not being a good officer, in my case, or a chaplain, or, or, or not outside. The greatest responsibility, the only thing that will follow me and follow Deb, Debbie on the other side of eternity is this. It's love of God. And it begins in the home. And there may be times when, I know because I've seen it, any father has, when you just, when the mama just, just bawl, cries. And just says, you know, I don't know what else to do. Right? I'm out of answers. I'm exhausted. I'm tired all the time. And behind privacy, behind closed doors, you, the, I mean, you've seen it too. They just pour their hearts out to God. And it breaks my heart when I, you know, I mean, all, you just, just hug and say, well, it'll be fine, you know, it'll be fine. There is a great story that I want to close with from Genesis 16. We all know the story well, those of us who, who enjoy Scripture, where the Egyptian handmaiden, the slave, Hagar, was given to Sarah, the wife of Abram, of Abraham, later Abraham. So you have Sarah had, had uh, Hagar as, as her hand servant, her, her, her maid servant. And we all know the story. Eventually, Hagar is with child. It's Abraham's child. And Sarah is so jealous. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 16, she began to mistreat Hagar. And you can imagine what that would be. Even Abraham, and I think he's misguided here, even Abraham said, well, she's, you know, do with her as you will. And it got so bad, probably threatening her life and the life of her unborn baby, that Hagar ran away. Do you know the, 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 the penalty of a, of a slave, of a servant running away from their master? It was death, but apparently it was no better right there. And so Hagar runs for her life. An angel of the Lord found her at a spring in the wilderness. And this is what the angel said in Genesis 16. He says, El Roi will help you. Now, there are many names for God in the Old Testament. One that is not used very often is El Roi, the God who sees. And the angel said, God sees. He, he sees the jealousy of Sarah. He sees your life being threatened. And El Roi will protect you. Return to Sarah and Abram. And she did. And soon Ishmael was born. Ishmael means God hears. Fourteen years later, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, and the line of our Lord Jesus Christ was preserved. El Roi, every time we, you as mothers especially, of young children, think that no one is even listening or no one sees El Roi. Every time you feel as though that you just can't go another step because you are just exhausted. El Roi. Every time you can't even say words because you're crying so much. El Roi. God sees. The reason the world dismisses 
you as a mother and a homemaker is because they're not in the work of the kingdom. The prince of darkness has duped them all. And only through the light of Christ can the darkness, it can't tolerate the light of Christ. That's the only chance our nation and our world has. But don't let you, do not grow weary of well-doing. I wish I had better words to use. I've prayed about this and I've said, Lord, you know, this is important stuff. Other sermons I preach I think are important. I think God's Word is always important. But there is no calling in all of Scripture that has a greater responsibility than a parent, a mother. And by the way, if the babies cry during worship, you, it's, it's, it's not only good, it's, it's, it's the Lord saying, Whittington, you, I want you to be quiet. You know, enough. So if the babies were to cry, and there are certain places that I've heard more babies than here, you mamas must be really good with your little ones. I don't know how to close this. I just want to reiterate, don't grow weary of well-doing. El Roi, God sees. And if we can help in any way, we're here. I mean, I'm old. Debbie's not as old. We've, we've, we've got our children gone and raised. We have our grandchildren. We've, two of them are gone. They're even grown. So we, you know, she has plenty of time. You can... <laughs> I would like to say this, and this, you know, and, I, and I, I'm cognizant of the time, I know. I, I would like to say, we are family. I, I use it so much in, in, in the little bit of Spanish I share, but it's so true. And, and, but, but families, even 500 plus, you're still family. I mean, you know, it's family. It doesn't have to be 10. It can be 500. How many of you mothers? Let me, uh, you don't have, well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really take a, a chance here. If those of you whose children are either, they've already left the home or they're, or they're teenagers in the home or grown in the home, you know, how many of you mothers would more than happy mentor a younger mother? Just, I mean, let me see a show of hands. Yeah, yeah. Are there, uh, uh, you know, by the way, mentors are not perfect. Trust me. All a mentor does is say, you know, I've been there, I've done that, I've made mistakes, let me listen to you, and by the way, it's going to be okay. You know, we're going to get over this, you're going to get over this. You know, it's going to be okay. I, I would love for our younger mothers to seek out some of the older ladies. Titus chapter 2. You want to have another sermon? Look at Titus 2, when Paul talks about true doctrine, didache. We think of doctrine as being some sort of, you know, baptisms on the list. In fact, doctrine in Scripture has nothing to do with that. In Titus 2, Paul says, teach sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Men, older men, train the young men. Older women, help the young women. That's sound teaching. So I encourage all of you who are mothers who are struggling in any way, just pick up the phone. Call Deb. It's okay. She's really good at what she did and does. And I can name the, some of you out there too, but I won't do that. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up. It's been a beautiful Mother's Day. I pray the message that God has spoken to your heart. Keep the grain, lose the... That's always true, by the way, in everything that we hear. The Lord speaks to all of us, speaks through Dwayne and William and, and Thomas and the prayer leaders and me. So keep that kernel of truth and let the Holy Spirit just let it resonate all week long. God bless you all as together we stand for this song and sing. Come forward. Standing.